I had no idea until I met Jesus. And really the, the crux of this message is that there are some things about life that you will never understand until you meet Jesus because you were born to be in relationship with Christ. And there are some things that you will never get until you have a born-again, uh, transformed experience with Christ. Now, I don't mean you came to church and you cried a little bit. I don't mean that. I don't, I don't mean that you felt sorry and, and, and you came to the altar and you prayed. I don't mean that. I mean a transformational experience with Christ where your spirit was dead and he brought you to life. I'll never forget the moment that happened to me in the driveway. It's like I, I, I finally had come to the end of myself and I gave myself over to Christ and, and gave my life to Christ. And I knew in that moment that God was real and I was never turning back. Amen. And, and God transformed my life. My, my dead spirit came to life and I haven't been the same since. And, and God has unfolded and revealed to me more of what life is really about, and I'm still learning more of it. And, and can I tell you, it's a beautiful thing. Life in Christ is a beautiful thing, and it's bigger than what you can imagine. And I could attempt to tell you about it, and there are uh, parts of my message today where I'm going to try to tell you about it, but really, you can't know it until you see it yourself and feel it yourself and experience it yourself. I want to encourage you to know that there is some things about life you will never know until you meet Jesus. Let me say, like I've said before, I was born in a spiritual pit. When you and I are born, we are born with dead spirits because man has fallen. What does that mean? That means it's like you're in a spiritual pit. Imagine that you were born in the depths of a well. You're down uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 feet in the ground in a well. You suddenly come to life, and all you know is this well. It's completely dark. You have no idea what light is because all you've seen is darkness. It smells awful. You have no idea what fresh air is because all you've ever smelt was the muck and mire that you've been laying in. All you know is the mud and the walls around you and the darkness. That's all you know. And you have no idea that above you, there's a beautiful world that God has prepared for you. But you've never seen it. You've never dreamed it. You've never imagined it. All you know is this pitiful, awful existence. It's all you've ever experienced in your life. And so what do you do? You try to make the best of it. You feel like, you know, let me get comfortable in the mud. Let me get used to the way it smells. Let me try to just make the most of the situation I'm in. And unfortunately, without Christ, that's how most people are living their lives today. They're trying to make the most of a pit. They're trying to make the most of the stink and the darkness and the confinement. They're laying in the bottom of a pit and they have no idea they're there because they've never experienced what it's like above them until one day Jesus comes by. And Jesus shines his light inside of the pit and all of a sudden they look up and they can see what they've never seen before. They can see that they're in a pit. And there's something beautiful and wonderful above them, and they long for that. And listen, when you come to the house of God, and you hear the word of God, and you feel conviction in your heart, and Christ is pulling you, that's Jesus turning the light on in your soul, trying to tell you, I got something better for you. Let me lift you up. When you're driving down the road in your car and you listen to that song and it speaks to your heart and you feel your need of God, that's Jesus above your pit shining the light upon you, letting you know I've got something better for you. He's letting you know I want to save you. If you just let me, I'll save you. And when you say yes to Christ, he climbs down in your pit and he gets dirty and muddy with you and he picks you up and puts you on his shoulders and he takes you up to the top and he sets your feet on solid ground and he heals your soul and he heals your body and he cleanses your mind and he makes you right with God and he sets your feet upon a solid rock. And I want to talk to you today about how God puts a new song in your mouth hallelujah David said in Psalms 40 I waited patiently for the Lord he inclined to me and heard my cry he brought me up out of the pit of destruction out of the miry clay he set my feet upon a rock making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and will trust in the Lord. 
In the first week of this series, we learned that Jesus puts our feet upon a solid rock. He gives us a foundation for living that cannot be moved. We know that we have our faith in him. We abide in his love, and life can't change that. Circumstances can't change that. Sicknesses, financial problems, the change in, in government, all of the things around us seem to be swirling and are never consistent, but under our feet is my relationship with God that is firm. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't know what a firm foundation is. The next week we learned that he gave us a new direction. He made our footsteps firm. He gave our life purpose and meaning. And he says, follow me. Come on, I'm not only going to set your feet upon a solid rock, I'm going to show you how to live from day to day. I'm going to walk with you and give your life purpose and meaning so that when you get up in the morning, you know who you are and you know why you exist and you know where you're headed. Hallelujah. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have firm footsteps. But he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. I began to think of what did David mean when he said he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Did you know there's a song in your mouth? There's a song that comes from the depths of your heart. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks when you speak trashy stuff and when the song in your mouth is not good, it's from the depths of your heart. Some of you may be right now thinking of the songs that you like to sing. I'm not necessarily talking about what comes on the radio, but I'm talking about the lyrics and melody of your soul and what your life stands for and how you describe things. And, and if your life is all about what you haven't got, and if your life is all about you're a victim, and if your life is all about gloom, despair, and, and terrible things, you're singing a song whether you know it or not, and the world is listening to the words that are coming out of your mouth. Come on, a lot of people are feeling sorry for themselves. They're singing songs like Born to Lose. I've lived my life in vain. Every dream has only brought me pain. Whoa, that's sad, isn't it? Their whole life is like that. I want to read to the, you the lyrics of a, a very popular song that Johnny Cash sang, and it's called Hurt. It says, I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. I focus on the pain, the only thing that's real. The needle tears a hole, the old familiar sting. I try to kill it all away, but I remember everything. What have I become, my sweetest friend? Everyone I know goes away in the end. There's some misery in the world today. There are some songs that are as despairing and difficult as you can imagine. It is the soundtrack to the life in the pit. The songs in the pit are songs of desperation, of hurt and pain and anger and, and sickness. And I don't know if you know it or not, but you're singing a song. And if you're in the pit, the song you're singing is not a good one. The song you're singing is one of hurt and pain and difficulty. Oh, but I remember when Jesus lifted me out of the pit, he put a new song in my mouth. No longer was I singing Born to Lose. I was singing Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was not singing how miserable is my life. I was singing how great is our God. Sing it with me. How great is our God. Oh, he put a new song in my mouth, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see glory to his name. I want to show you how God can change the song in your heart. I want to show you today how Jesus wants to change the soundtrack of your life. I want Jesus, you to see how Jesus can have people looking at you and seeing you singing a different song and your life having a different melody and different lyrics, how that he can make everything different in your life if you would just let him. You have no idea how beautiful God can make the soundtrack of your life until you meet Jesus. Glory to his name. Let's talk about the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul is all in the New Testament. He, mo he wrote most of the New Testament and a great apostle of God. He raised the dead. He preached. He started churches. He did all kinds of miraculous things. The great Apostle Paul. But he started out with a different name and a different attitude and a different song. 
Paul was first named Saul. His name was only changed after he came to Christ. And Saul had a different song. His song was this, I hate Christ and I hate Christians. He hated Christians. In fact, if Paul were alive today and had his authority, he would come into this place and arrest every one of you for being here today. In Acts 8, 1 through 3, it says, Saul was hearty in agreement with putting Stephen to death on that day. A great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Saul had a song in his heart, and his heart was anger. His song was anger and hatred and bitterness. And I hate Christ. I hate what he stands for. I believe he's a phony, and I hate all of those crazy people following him, and I want to destroy them, and I want to tear them down. But Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Hallelujah. I love the imagery of, of Paul, Saul's conversion to Paul because he was on a horse, and Christ knocked him off his horse. Now, I want to tell you something. If you're on your high horse and you feel like you got it all together and you know exactly what you're doing, when you come upon Jesus, he will knock you off your high horse. You will land on your rear end. Paul could not see. He was blind. In fact, he had fallen off of his horse. He couldn't see. He couldn't even take care of himself at that point. I want to read to you in Acts 9, 1 through 22. Follow with me. This is a, a big chunk of scripture, but it's so good. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if they found any that belonged to the way of Christ, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly... <laughs> I mean, stop there for a minute. I thank God for the suddenlies in my life. When I was headed somewhere and then suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If you read that in your Bible, those words are in red because Jesus is talking now. And he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up. Enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but no, seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, though his eyes were open. He could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he said. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how he does much harm to your saints at Jerusalem. Here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from Saul's eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now watch this. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. Hallelujah. Saul's singing a new song. I don't know if y'all are noticing this or not. He is saying that Jesus is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who was in Jerusalem who destroyed those who called on his name? And who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. I love this story. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the story of Saul being lifted up out of a pit and discovering things he never dreamed possible. 
Saul was a trained theologian. He knew all about God from the Old Testament. He knew about the Jewish God. He knew about the coming Messiah. He knew all the things from past to present and what was coming in the future. He just didn't have revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he thought by persecuting Jesus, he was helping God. He thought that was the right thing to do. But what he didn't know, being in the pit, was that Jesus was the Messiah. But when Jesus made himself known to Paul, everything began to change. He changed from someone who hated Christ who began to proclaim Jesus. Come on. <laughs> you know, I grew up in church, and I remember being a young man, not being saved, and, and being uh, ambivalent uh, towards Christians and some things about Christianity. Even though I grew up in church, I, you know, when, when someone on Preacher on TV would ask for money, I'd be... I'd be like, oh, they're all after your money and all of that. And I see that all the time today. They, you know, people online that think all preachers are, are you know, uh, hungry for money and just dying for money because look how big Joel Osteen's house is. Well, I, I got news for you. Um, <laughs> one out of a million preachers has a Joel Osteen house, and the rest are very humble. In fact, many preachers work a full-time job so that they can help pay the church's bills and also pastor the church. And to those pastors that are do that, my hat is off to you. God bless bless you for doing God's work in spite of people persecuting what you're doing. And I used to think that way because I couldn't see. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have a, a clear understanding or revelation that when people give, God blesses them, that it's the right thing to do. Paul had no idea. He thought he was doing the right thing, but he did not. So Paul was changed from Saul. God put a new song in his mouth. And I want you to watch something in Acts 16. You want to hear Paul's song? Paul's new song? We're about to hear Paul's new song. Have you ever wondered what Paul's new song was? God put a new song in his mouth. His old song was, I hate Christians, I hate Christ, I'm mad at the world, and I'm angry, and now you're all going to pay for it. His new song, watch this. Paul is preaching in the city of Philippi. And there's this demon-possessed girl that's following him around. And because she has a demon in her, she knows that Paul has the Holy Spirit in him. And so she's following Paul around, and she's making note of that publicly. She's kind of irritating Paul, just following him around, saying, Yeah, you're, you're one of those people who are full of the Spirit. You're one of God's people. And, and she's, she's irritating Paul. And at some point, he becomes so irritated, he turns around and he looks at her, and he casts the demon out of her. Now, this becomes a problem. Because she was a slave girl, and her owner used the power of the demon to predict the future. So people would come, and they would pay money, and this demon would predict the future through this slave girl, and they made a lot of money that way. Now, as soon as the demon left this girl, the slave owner got furious because he saw that his money wagon was over with. He wasn't happy for her that she was freed from the demon. That was his money train, and he was mad that now he wasn't going to have any way to keep his business going. So he's furious, and he gets the whole town in an uproar and mad at Paul and Silas who've been preaching there. Now watch what happens. In verse 22, Acts 16, the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them, Paul and Silas, to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Let's just stop right there. Sometimes it's not fair being a Christian. Sometimes you get treated poorly by the world. And some of us today, uh, you're going to have to make a big sacrifice for Christ, it's what you're called to do. You remember when God spoke to Ananias about Saul, he said, I'm going to show him the things he must suffer for me. And what's happening to Paul right now? He's being beaten, falsely accused, and thrown into prison, not knowing what the future holds. And for every one of you Christians today who won't go to church because the sermon's too long, every one of you Christians today who won't go to church because you didn't like the song they did last week, 
Every one of you Christians today who don't want to pray, who don't want to participate, who don't want to be a part of what the church has been doing, let me tell you today, it doesn't matter which church you go to or who your pastor is, look at the example of Paul. You have not been beaten. You have not been thrown in prison for the sake of the gospel. And until you do, maybe it's time that we should worship and stop whining. Come on. Paul and Silas have been beaten. They've been thrown in prison. They don't know what the future holds. But the Bible says in verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praises to our God. Hallelujah. Saul's got a new song. He had, in the earthly realm, he had every right to complain. He had every right to whine and be mad and, and do the, oh, God, why did you let this happen? God, why did you let this happen to me? I served you. I did what you asked, and here I am in this condition. Come on, some of you, that sounds real familiar because that's a song coming out of your mouth. Come on. But Paul had a different song. Instead of complaining about his situation, he just began to praise God in spite of his situation. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, the jailer fell before Paul and Silas, and after that he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Saul had a new song. He wasn't Saul anymore. He was Paul. He wasn't singing, born to lose. I'm mad at the world. I hate Jesus. He was singing, how great is my God. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, Jesus will put a new song in your mouth that you can sing no matter what your condition is. The new song that Jesus wants to put in your mouth is not dependent upon your circumstances. Paul was singing at a time when it was the midnight hour, when it was the darkest, when he'd had a rough day. Come on. He had, many times we have a rough day, we lay in bed at night and, and we sit there and stew and how bad it was and we worry about what tomorrow holds instead of knowing that even at the midnight hour, God is still on the throne and we just begin to rest in him and praise him for who he is. His song didn't depend on circumstances. It didn't depend upon his condition. Paul wasn't feeling good. You know how I know that? Because he had been beaten with many blows. They had beaten him just because he set a girl free from a demon. And he was there. Paul and Silas were suffering. Let me tell you something today, Christian. You better sing praises to God even when you're broke. You better sing praises to God even when someone you love is gone. You better sing praises to God when the job lays you off. You better sing praises to God when you're sick and the doctor's got out a bad report for you. You better keep singing praises to God. You see, the song that Jesus puts in your heart doesn't need an outcome. It, they didn't know what was going to happen to them. They could die tomorrow. They could die tonight. At any moment, someone could come in and cut their head off, and that'd be the end of them. And yet here they were still praising God because they didn't need to know the outcome. They knew the one who holds the outcome. Hallelujah. And they kept their faith in Christ. I'm telling you, this is the kind of stuff that only happens when you've met Jesus. This is the kind of stuff that you're capable of. You had no idea you could sing a song like this until you met Jesus. Paul's new song wasn't dependent on circumstances, and it was a song that needed to be sung out loud. How many of you are out loud singers? Come on, I know my dad and me will just bust out in song at any moment, and we don't care where we are. And we don't care what you know or what you think. Or, and if you look at us crazy, that's in, for me, it's even more enjoyable because I get to embarrass my wife a little bit. That's always nice and H-E-B. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes it's just the song just comes out of you. Amen. You hear it and you feel it and it's in you. And, and, and sometimes it's, a, it's an old ear. Or sometimes it's, it's baby shark. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Come on, it's in your head now, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. When God puts a song in your heart, his song in your heart, it's a song that's going to get sung out loud. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be speaking it with your physical mouth. It means that your life is going to be declaring it. 
Amen. If you're singing a song from the pit or a song from Jesus, it's still being sung out loud. Listen, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God wants you to speak and sing what is in the depths of your heart. That means you have an opportunity to complain, but God says, don't complain. Praise me. Hallelujah. You have an opportunity to whine. God says, don't whine. Worship me. Hallelujah. You have an opportunity to describe how bad it is. God says, stop describing your situation and describe your God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a song to be sung out loud. The Bible says many people would see it and hear. Sometimes I just can't help but sing when I realize how good God is. Whew. You know, there are times I get in the flesh and I look at the world and situations and the bank account and, and the money and the empty pews and the situations around me that ain't necessarily good and I can start singing a song from the pit from where I was before. And like, well, I knew it wasn't going to work out. And, you know, the devil, he's like the choir director. You know, he's trying to get you to sing that old gloom, despair, and agony on me. And born to lose, I've lived my life in vain. And all of this is a waste of time. And, and you're never going to get ahead. And here he is, he's directing the choir. And before you know it, you're up on stage singing with him. You're in the flesh. But then, oh, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and he wakes you up and you begin to see in the spirit realm. Come on. And as you see in the spirit realm, you start singing a new song. Hallelujah. That God is still on the throne. Hallelujah. This new song is not dependent on circumstances. It's to be sung out loud. And this new song is powerful. Sing your praise, church, because it's powerful. The Bible says when they sang at the midnight hour, they prayed and sang and worshiped God, the earth shook. Come on, we need some earth shaking in our world, don't we? We need some earth shaking in our politics and in our country. We need some earth shaking in our families and our community. We need some earth shaking. And it comes when we worship, when we sing the song that Jesus put in our heart. The earth shook and the prison doors were opened. All the things that held them back suddenly moved of their own accord. Here you are thinking you got to be smart and wise and play it right and you need help and you need money and you need education and the doors in front of you. You're just going to have to be clever and find the key or pick the lock. All the while, all you needed to do was sing the new song and God would open the doors. Amen. God would open the doors in your life. Hallelujah. Oh, when you complain, you settle into your situation. Come on. You know, you just, you just kind of scrunch in to your situation. You just start hanging curtains. You know, I always say when Jesus went into the tomb, he was in the tomb, but he didn't make himself at home there. He didn't hang curtains and, and buy furniture and order stuff from Wayfair. and start. He didn't put a welcome mat out because he wasn't staying there. Come on, stop hanging curtains in the tomb. Stop putting the welcome mat out. That's not your address. Down the pit is not your address. That's not where you belong, amen? When you start complaining, you're, you're hanging curtains in the tomb. You're saying, this is where I belong. This is who I am. That's why I'm whining about it. But when you have an expectation of freedom, you'll sing a different song. Hallelujah. You'll know that good things are coming your way. Can I tell you something? The doors will open. The earth will shake. God will move heaven and earth on your behalf when you sing the song that Jesus put in your heart. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. I want you to get this today, church. Some of you are still stuck in a prison because you stopped singing at the midnight hour. You stopped calling on God. You stopped praising him. You, stopped, you started paying more attention to the difficulties in the world around you and in your situation than you did to the God who could deliver you from all of them. You started looking at your thing and feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, I hope you get this. I hope you get this. There are no victims in the kingdom of God. How can you be a victim and be victorious at the same time? While you've sat in the prison thinking you're a victim, God wants you to sing the song of victory. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Hallelujah. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is through him and the song that I sing that my prison doors are open that I make it through. I may be facing some things today, but I'm singing a song because I know victory is coming. Victory is coming. It's mine. I'm not a victim. Hallelujah. 
It's not dependent on circumstances. This song is supposed to be sung out loud. It's a song that's powerful, and it's a song that's a witness to the world. We've established this, that the reason you're still here on earth is you're a witness to the world. God wants to use you for his purpose. He wants you to be a living letter written to the world around you so they can see what Jesus could do even in a knucklehead like you and me. Come on. That he can use anybody. He can restore anybody from any situation. Hallelujah. And, and, and I don't mean that kind of Christianity where years ago I had a problem and now I'm all that. I mean that Christianity that years ago I had problems and today I have problems and tomorrow I got problems and I'm still a knucklehead and yet God loves me and he accepts me and he made me his child and he uses me. Hallelujah. Many will see and fear. Many shall see and fear. You know, I thought about that this week. Many shall see and fear. People are watching your life and you don't even know it. They're watching your life. They're paying attention to the song that your life is singing and the melody is setting the mood for their expectation. Are you catching that? You're, the people close to you, most importantly, some of you parents need to change your attitude and the way you talk because you're sending a, a, a song from the pit down to your kids. Because you're whining about stuff all the time. You're acting like a victim and like, uh, like nobody's treated you fairly and, and, and like nothing's ever going to work out. And you keep speaking that out. You keep singing that song. And you know what your kids are doing? They're catching your song. And I'm here to challenge you today. You need to sing a new song. You need to quit acting like you're a victim. Come on. You are not a victim. You are victorious in Jesus Christ our Lord. And you stopped singing, so the prison doors are still closed. This is a witness to the world, to the people around you. People are watching you. What song are you singing? Many shall see and fear. You know what I want the lost to do when they get around me? I want them to hear the song of Jesus and begin to think. The light comes on above their pit, and they begin to think, uh-oh, what if God is real? What if the Bible is real? It says many shall see in fear. The fear of the Lord is good when you don't know Jesus because it will help you know you better get something done about your life. Amen? Amen? I'm not here to tell you that everyone in the world is saved. The Bible says there are two roads and one is really narrow and few are on it and it's the one that leads to eternal life. There's another road that's really wide and a whole lot of people are on that road and it's the one that leads to hell. That's not my choice. That's how God made it to be. And listen, we make the choice when we decide whether we're going to let Jesus put a new song in our mouth or not. Come on, are you with me today? Hallelujah. He put a new song in my mouth. Many shall see and fear. They'll be challenged with conviction by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the jailer was afraid. Do you catch his fear? He was first afraid because in his day, if prisoners escaped while you were on uh, patrol, you were the jailer. Uh, you would die. They would kill you. So he, he was just going to get it over with and kill himself. I'm not going to let them kill me. I'm going to just do it myself. He was afraid in fear. And Paul said, no, 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 no. None of us prisoners, even though the doors have opened, we haven't ran off. We're still here. So just don't do that. And he fell at his feet trembling because he knew there was a God. He knew there was a God. You know why he knew? Because at the midnight hour, Paul was singing a new song. And the earth began to shake and the doors opened. Hallelujah. And God's presence became real. I want you to know that when you sing a new song, the world would look at you and consider and realize. And God will shine the light in their life. And they'll begin to know that that there is a God, and Jesus is his son, and he is the only way, the truth, and the life. Come on, give him a big hand of praise today. Glory to his name. So I want to ask you, what song have you been singing? Is it the song of the pit? If you're watching me today on the internet, is it the song of the pit? Have you been singing the song that's the only song you know? And you have no idea what true light looks like because all you've never known is darkness. You have no idea what spiritual fresh air smells like because all you've smelled is the pit. All you've known, I came to tell you today that if you don't know Jesus, you have no idea what God has for you. That your eyes have never seen. Your ears have never heard something so wonderful. It's never even entered into your heart how good it could be to know Jesus. I'm not here to tell you that serving Christ means you'll never have a problem. I'm not here to tell you any of that. 
What I'm here to tell you is there are deep things in the spirit that are better than all the money in the world. It's better than health. It's better than all of the stuff this world could offer you. It is so good that it'll make you sing a song, a new song, a song of praise to our God. Hallelujah. All you have to do is let Jesus lift you up out of the pit. I'm not talking about religion and you coming to church and signing the role. I'm not talking about you behaving better or any of that stuff. Listen, God will take all care of all of that at some other point in your life. He will work with you. What I'm talking about is just saying, Jesus, save me. I can do nothing to help you. Just save me, Jesus. Just come out into this pit of my life and lift me up and save me. I give my life to you today. I turn myself over to you today. So I want to pray with you all today in Jesus' name. Father, I just pray right now for those who are in the pit. And through the message of this word today, they're beginning to realize the light has been shined over the top of their pit. And they're looking up and they're seeing that there's a world they've never dreamed possible. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're talking to them right now and you're showing them glimpses of your love and, and the good things that you've planned for them. And I just challenge you to respond to Jesus. Say yes. It's an act of faith. Yes, it's an act of faith. You don't have to understand it. Just say yes. Jesus, save me. Come into my life and make me new. Change everything in me. I believe that you're the son of God, that you died for me and you lived for me. And I turn my heart open to you. And I want to I wanna abide in all of the good things you have for me and done for me. Bring my spirit to life. In Jesus' name. Oh, la motaricata sai. Hallelujah. I just feel, I feel right now that dead spirits have been brought to life. And you're beginning to feel things in the depths of who you are that you've never felt before. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I pray for these new creatures in Christ. Lord, I pray, God, oh, Lord Jesus, that you would just begin to wipe all of the dirt off of their lives. You would heal the hurt of their past. You would lift them out of the trouble that they're in today. You would set their feet on a firm foundation. You'd establish the direction of their footsteps. And you'd put a new song in their mouth.